Uh, I, I had the good fortune of uh, Paul to uh, Israel to uh, develop a digital future. So as Paul mentioned, he ships discs. And as we know in all media, discs will eventually be dead. And so Paul looked at it and said, hey, cloud-based gaming, Israeli technology, I think it's a good idea. And um, he, that's how he got involved uh, with me with Playcast. Uh, I was... Uh, I was a senior executive at uh, Sony Pictures for a long time. I built and ran the digital entertainment division there. Uh, when I left Sony, I did a couple of things. I started my own uh, crowdsourced animation company, made, produced and directed a couple of animated short films with people around the world. And I became a venture partner, um, jo joined a venture company and started investing in Israel and in Los Angeles in the game and in the video space. Um, and uh, we thought, we'd have a little conversation about the games world. Very dynamic time as always in the games business. A Little bit about kind of where it's going from a disc standpoint and a cloud streaming standpoint. Maybe a little bit of discussion about the dramatic change and dynamic change in the mobile space. Um, little discussion about recent M&A activity. You may have heard of a little two and a half billion dollar deal that got done a couple days ago. Microsoft bought a little game company. Um, Amazon bought a little game streaming company for about a billion dollars two weeks ago. So um, a lot of things that basically didn't exist five, six years ago are now worth billions of dollars in this space. And um, thought we'd talk about that. Uh, two observations of my time in Israel is that the engineering base here is very, very exciting to be a part of. That the technology, the maturity of the engineers here, the technical people, um, is slightly different from the U.S., um, but uh, definitely equal or above it in certain ways. Um, when you look at what's happening in the gaming business, and we talked about disc-based products uh, or the console that originally started out as plug and play and now is plug, play, and be connected, um, in the console market, uh, the industry has changed. There used to be an avid audience, there still is a very avid audience, but they used to buy one game every month. And now it seems that that gaming market is buying the bigger games and playing those games more. There's still a tremendous appetite for the catalog of gaming, but the catalog is changing. The gaming market, people want to play gaming all the time. So they want to play on their mobile phone, their mobile devices. They want to play games different ways with the subscription service. And that's how the streaming and the cloud comes into market. That Companies like Playcast can deliver games uh, via the TV um, to a second home, to a casual gamer, to a hardcore gamer who just wants to play um, in his living room as opposed to the console market. So there's a lot of changes going on within the gaming business. Israel, you, you the game is a lot less. So uh, you may not be as with the at this um, to PlayStation and Does this one work um, I, the the Pauls and I have obviously been involved in the game business for a long time really going back to early Nintendo days and cartridges and the evolutions to this um, and what's interesting is even as the mobile games business and the, and the tablet business has become massive multi-billion dollar businesses we're still in an era where individual disc games can sell half a billion units. Activision ship Destiny two weeks ago, estimated sales for the first week were $500 million? Half a billion dollars. The physical product. And now with the impact of digital, they can generate you know, another 20, 30, 50% of their revenue through digital. Um, whether that is playing online, uh, all the additional features that a digital uh, connection can bring. Well, what's interesting about a game like Destiny, and you look at half a billion dollars, and um, that's $500 million in the first week. That represents the whole lifetime box office of the biggest film release this year. Right, so Captain America in the U.S. In, Captain America in the U.S. and in the rest of the world generated close to $600 million in box office. Destiny just in it generated that in one week in the United States in its sales. To give you a sense of the scope and the magnitude of the 
the games business in relation to other forms of entertainment. What's exciting about Destiny is that it's a brand new property, a new brand that now has tremendous value to a company like Activision. Um, the other large brands that have, have impacted the billion dollar market are you know, the Call of Duty from Activision, the Grand Theft Autos from Take-Two. Uh, prior to my joining Kokum as chairman, I was president and on the board and then CEO of Take-Two from 2001 to 2007, and the company grew from a quarter of a billion dollars to a billion and a half dollars in revenue, and I was fortunate to be part of that growth. Um, what was exciting was growing the studio for you could control your own uh, talent and your own development. Um, so we purchased a number of different studios, gave a lot of resources to the Rockstar guys, who are the most creative game developers in the market. And it was fun to watch the company grow from 250 employees to 1,500 employees, which also brought a whole different set of issues and problems and opportunities. So um, I hate to say this, but you guys don't look like much of a gamer audience. H how many people have actually played Grand Theft Auto in the crowd? About four or five. OK, so for those of you who don't know, Grand Theft Auto was the first game to the first truly free-range game that allowed you to move around in the world in an unrestricted way and not follow a set gameplay path. But what made that gameplay path so interesting is that you were in a, in a very corrupt world where you essentially got to play a pimp and a car thief and run people over and shoot them down and beat up hookers. And that made it very fun and very controversial. That Grand Theft Auto is a franchise that's now Almost 20 years old? Yep, yes. As ship? So I would describe it slightly different, that it was an open world and you had tons of missions to solve and you had a lot of choices. Of I, I would focus on the things. pimps and hoes, because that's why people played the game. But it was, an, it was a breakthrough game from a physics standpoint and actually served as the model for, you know, we mentioned Call of Duty. There's a whole host of games that followed, up until Grand Theft Auto, you were in a very restricted set world, where it's almost like you, you followed the ways path and you had to follow that path to get to your destination no matter what. After Grand Theft Auto, they gave you the map and they said, have fun in this world. So that, from a creativity standpoint, opened up gaming because you now had a tremendous amount of choices. And that brought on uh, a whole new level of gaming for the consumer because it was so compelling. You could play it hours and hours of gameplay. It wasn't just linear from start to finish. Some of those choices were, did you want to steal the Corvette or the Camaro? Did you want to rob the bank or hold up the liquor store? That's part of what made the game so compelling is it was a fantasy for people to go outside of their daily lives and have a bunch of experiences that they couldn't have in real life. And that's really the essence of a lot of what video gaming does in a more evolved manner than the movie business. The movie business takes you and puts you in an escapist world and you can go and you can watch Frodo lead the journey on the Lord of the Rings. In the games business, you can watch people be bad. In Grand Theft Auto, you could be bad. And you could customize your character, you could actually build into the AI your tendencies what you would do, what you wouldn't do in certain situations. Um, it was very challenging and compelling, and it helped move the gaming business to the next level that you're seeing in the marketplace now, and then opened up uh, the whole world of online gaming, where you could have multiple uh, choices to, to finish missions or to win the game. In many ways, Minecraft is kind of a natural evolution from the innovations that Grand Theft Auto spawned. So Grand Theft Auto basically opened up the world for you to investigate it. Minecraft opened up the world for you to create it. And what really drives, and I, I think the reason Microsoft ended up buying Minecraft is because it's a mass creativity platform. And that's the very interesting evolution in the game space. It's been more and more empowerment of the consumer inside the world. Um, and in, in a game like Minecraft and other products, you get invested in the game. So you build your characters, you build your customization of the product. 
So it's truly compelling that makes you come back and keep playing that game. So the Minecraft acquisition is, is a very interesting one to look at from the fact that Microsoft just invested two and a half billion dollars for this compelling piece of content that will be exclusive to them and not just exclusive to them on the Xbox 360 and the Xbox One, but a major part of Xbox Live, which is a, 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 a people don't realize how big that is and how compelling a story that that has developed from originally their investment to have an online community that offered tremendous amount of services to play games, but now I think believe there's 50 million people that are on Xbox Live and they're not just playing games, they're downloading movies, they're uh, searching for other types of content um, in other forms. It's just a, a, a giant community that's a launching pad for Xbox and shows how strong that Xbox is in the marketplace. Um, you want to talk about PlayStation now? Sure. Uh, just what, one of the things that's interesting about Minecraft and specifically interesting in, in kind of a DLD context, which is a conference that really brings Europe and Israel and the rest of the world together. I mean, Minecraft is started by a, a bunch of guys in, in Northern Europe and is essentially a global phenomenon being acquired by, you know, one of the dominant software companies in the world. And truly an indication of what creating intellectual property in the game space can be and how interconnected the game world is today. How the, the world and the game work world truly overlap in, in a way that is rare in, in other businesses. And truly global. What, what's interesting is, is also that, you know, Minecraft is essentially available in all platforms, available in multiple ways. And one of the things that's evolving from, from the games business and one of the reasons Playcast is exciting is it frees um, existing established games from being locked into a PlayStation or an Xbox and allowing that streaming through TV sets directly and, and uh, other over-the-top devices, which clearly is a big evolution. So gaming has grown to a lifestyle. It's just uh, like reading a book, watching a movie. So if you think of the ability to stream from the cloud and to offer companies like Playcast that can offer the streaming service so you can when you sit in your living room or your, your bedroom or your office, you can now stream a whole catalog of games and have that available to you instantly. And you can either have packages similar to other forms of content where it can be a subscription model for a series or a bunch of games, a bundle of games or different types of games, but also individual games. The reason, as Paul mentioned, it's exciting time in this space in terms of the evolution of cloud gaming is Sony recently launched a service called PlayStation Now, which today is only available on PlayStation 4s, but will ultimately be available on multiple devices in which they're streaming catalog games um, and you don't have to buy the disc. And um, what Playcast does is, is bring that same service directly to the TVs. And what's interesting is ultimately, we believe that any caliber game will be available on any powerful computing device. And we're very rapidly heading into that world where you don't need to play an iOS game or an Android game. It doesn't have to be resident on your device. You'll be able to stream it from the cloud and essentially play a much higher caliber game through a service like Playcast or PlayStation Now. Hi, uh, my name's Stephanie. Um, I was wondering what's your take on mobile? You haven't really talked about mobile and gaming. It's pretty big. It's massive. And it's truly global. Um, I, I think the really interesting thing about mobile is it, it reinforced something that I've always believed, which is essentially everybody in the planet is a gamer. They just need to find the right game. And it used to be that gamers were only guys who put, the, the view was you had to be a great first person shooter and you had to want to play Call of Duty or Halo. And now essentially people, more people play Candy Crush and, and Clash of Clans and, and more, more people basically play games on, on their mobile and spend more money playing games on their mobile than on any other platform. I also think mobile offers a new dimension to the console business. So if you have a fairly large brand and you want to extend it, instead of paying, playing Candy Crush or some simpler form of content, 
to extend a Call of Duty, a Grand Theft Auto, a, a brand like that to mobile where you can give the audience, the consumer, a short burst of that product. Um, so it's, it's, it has a lot of different dimensions to it and it's certainly only getting bigger and everyone now is changing in terms of you know, mobile phones, the audience um, is younger and younger, but it, they stay. They just continue as they uh, get older. It's not just women playing mobile, it's the whole audience. Kids, you know, the target market, that 17 to 34 year old male, women are on mobile, so it's a tremendous resource for someone who has content to derive additional revenue streams. Also, what's, what's really exciting about the mobile business is it used to take a lot of people and a lot of money to create a, a, a meaningful piece of intellectual property game or a meaningful revenue game. Six people sitting around a desk can create a multi-billion dollar game today. And I think it's very relevant, I think, for the DLD audience and for the Israel. One of, one of the things that I've been trying to push the, the Israeli community to do for a long time is to get more serious about the games business. Um, that you don't have to code. Historically, there were two dominant centers of gameplay development. There was Japan and the US. And then the Rockstar guys brought it to Scotland. And, na and then basically the Rovio guys brought it to Finland. And now essentially, in, in the mobile games business, any six people who actually have a passion and create something compelling to play can, can build a pretty meaningful game. And what that does is it frees kind of large-scale creativity for anybody in the world. I think that's what's really interesting about the mobile platform from a game standpoint. I, I think that certainly the guys at Kabam and Machine Zone would quibble with you in terms of the size of their business. Uh, a number of the U.S. businesses have also been consolidated into the Japanese business. They sold out much earlier. Um, but I also think that um, I, I, I think that you haven't seen as much innovation from a mobile standpoint, intuitive innovation on the mobile platform in the U.S. as you as you did in Europe. I think the things that that made you know Angry Birds compelling were very kind of intuitive use of the platform. I think the things that, that, that drove kind of Supercell and King and Rovio initially was just an out of thinking about gaming differently than established gaming did. And you, you mentioned European companies. You have to talk about Ubisoft, who has done a tremendous job. And out of Ubisoft, I don't know what the original background, you have Gameloft that did extremely well. And then, you know, in terms of the U.S. market, just looking at companies, Warner Brothers now has become a major factor in the games business. Um, just in terms of creating more content, um, it's probably the fourth or fifth largest player in the U.S. or the world market. Um, I think mobile in Japan is completely different because of the culture and the geographic conditions of small homes that mobile actually took is a dominant factor in Japan. Um, different than the U.S. market. The U.S. market was a little bit late to the whole mobile scene. Yeah, I, I, I do think that the part of the dynamic is, frankly, mobile was a more central part of people's lives as a device in Europe and in, J in Japan and in Korea um, earlier. And so I think you saw people taking more risks and innovating more on the platform earlier. I think you'll, you, you see more evolution in the United States. But frankly, I think it's a wonderful thing that basically th this is a platform that, that's being driven outside the United States and is more globally receptive and, and has more specific culturally driven initiatives. And just one thing to add that the mobile business with the size of the screens and the technology that's happening, happening in mobile, um, that's becoming bigger and bigger in North America from a gaming standpoint bigger that there are more sophisticated games being delivered to the mobile market. It's not just the simpler type of content. The one thing I would add on, on the mobile side is, and people don't talk about this as much, that much, but basically Steve Jobs hated games. Steve Jobs did not want the iPhone to be a gaming platform. Basically, gamers took over the platform and made the App Store a dominant vehicle for gaming. Gaming is a thing that drives itself and is very organic, and that, that's kind of the beauty of it is any platform evolves into a gaming platform because, ga because gamers want to play on anything. Thanks very much.